Say me me. Hi. Welcome back to part two on our look at the case against Anita Sarkeesian. Now, I thought, rather than simply just bashing on this individual, or at least uh, once we've deconstructed in a very constructive fashion, Anita's body of work as it pertains to her funded series called Feminist Frequency Tropes vs. Women in Gaming. I thought I would take the time to kind of deconstruct the supporters of Anita Sarkeesian as well as to kind of just talk about the reaction, to sort of talk about the um, viewpoints of people, some of whom are backers, some of whom were people who were open-minded to what Miss Anita Sarkeesian had to say uh, and felt that almost from point A to point B, things were lacking, or other things that were done prior to the actual release of the first video, as will be spoken of in this installment, rubbed people the wrong way, and not for good reason. Uh, in fact, uh, you may see this little corner here. It's actually my uh, laptop here, which I've brought uh, because uh, some individuals have made it clear that there are certain things that they would care to have said as to what really started them becoming more critical of Miss Anita Sarkeesian rather than receptive to what she had to say. Barring what you already know from part one and what you don't yet know from part three. Now before I get into either side of this, I want to make my position on this clear as if I don't think I did from part one. I didn't know Ms. Sarkeesian from a hole in the ground uh, when it came to everything that she had stood for or had come before. I had never heard of Feminist Frequency. I hadn't seen her previous works, and therefore I had no opinion of her one way or another. I didn't have a knee-jerk reaction when I heard about her project, unlike certain gamers, and they are a part of this that does need to be discussed, and will be discussed, throughout this second part, uh, second act, excuse me, if you will. And some people had absolutely no reason to dislike this because they had no understanding of anything for which Miss Anita Sarkeesian stood for or what her project was actually about. They heard a woman was critiquing the uh, viewpoint uh, or the critiquing gaming as a whole and finding it lacking and that rubbed people the wrong way. But if it were just simply that she were critiquing the gaming industry, if it were just simply that she was trying to take as objective a standpoint as possible, then an objectivist like myself would have almost no reason on a logical or factual level to disagree with Ms. Sarkeesian's work. Never mind what I now know of not just her body of work in general, but uh, everything that came before Feminist Frequency that should have put this project in doubt before word one was uttered by Ms. Sarkeesian. When I started seeing the kinds of videos that she made when people were linking me to Ms. Sarkeesian's original series just simply entitled Feminist Frequency and all the general factual errors, straw men at times that were ironically placed in videos about straw men, uh, and just inconsistencies with her messages uh, mess inconsistencies such as how it's not okay for women to be in any kind of undress in any kind of media, unless it's something like the Sarah Connor Chronicles, then even if it actually does not fit the narrative or is unnecessary, it's completely fine because Sarah Connor Chronicles is cool. And it's when you realize things like this that, that, that cracks in the armor of any kind of objective discussion about pop culture in general when it comes to anybody's representations, rights, or the effects thereof, or lack of effects thereof, and, uh, and how to move forward in a progressive manner. I didn't care that it was a woman who was wanting to talk about women's representations in gaming. I mean, that's logical. That, that's a given. There, there was no problems I had with that stance. The fact that, as far as I knew at the time, Ms. Sarkeesian was a feminist 
didn't bother me in the slightest, even though my viewpoints on not, not so much general feminism, but you know, pseudo-feminism and radical feminism was quickly changing, due in no small part to the parties who tend to make up the pseudo-feminist communities as well as the radical feminist communities. Uh, and I, I wasn't even upset that she had spoken up. Hell, I was speaking up against the gaming industry at the time that Anita was coming out because I was starting to see the problems that I was at times willfully ignoring when it came to the gaming industry on just the business end of things, as well as how they were treating their customers. Uh, I think she came about at a time when Capcom, for my opinion, was at its worst in terms of customer relations. So there was a talk to be had about problems within the gaming industry. I didn't realize just how, on some levels, at least the, appro the approach Anita was going to take would be so toxic to the gaming community at large, to friendships, to water cooler talk. But I came into this, I was skeptical on some levels, but I was willing to be shown by the time the first video came out with everything I was learning about her original channel, with everything that I was learning about how subjective, not objective, Ms. Sarkeesian's positions were, but I thought to myself, but if she's any kind of a professional, surely this funded, researched series would be something that would be at least a companion to the gaming industry, a companion that could be used and utilized to maybe make better stories, to make better characters, to make better experiences for gamers. And someday, maybe, maybe some individual, a woman or a man or a male-female team could come along and we could find some sort of meaningful ground on which to start to rebuild the industry into something that I think almost everybody could be happy. But in the case of Anita Sarkeesian and many of her followers, there really is no appeasement, even if Anita herself has presented her her kind of game that she would like to have put out there. With all the problematic issues of her game pitch, things she has spoken out against that are present in her pitch, you can almost see that she would almost be setting this game up to be something she would complain about later because, again, it falls under all the categories that she outlines. Which, if Anything from Act 3 is to be believed, I actually kind of think that may be completely on purpose and not just incompetence on the part of Ms. Sarkeesian or interested parties. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So let's take the middle of the road people, people not unlike myself. <sighs> A user whom I am just not going to identify, I know that if I wasn't in such a rush to try to get this series done and accurate as possible, I might have asked this individual if they wouldn't mind being identified for this video. But they did ask me to, uh, if I might present this viewpoint. And I think it's a good and valid viewpoint because it doesn't just simply subjectively go after Ms. Sarkeesian or feminism or women. You may have already found this information or info in your research for the Sarkeesian video you're doing, but I thought I'd share uh, show you this post from someone from the Escapist Forum. Now, the Escapist Forum is kind of interesting because if you know anything about the Escapist Forums, you know that it is home to Movie Bob Chipman, who we'll get to him in this installment on some levels, and Jim Sterling. Now, Jim, I have way more respect for than Chip, but again, so it's interesting that this sort of uh, information that is being shared by a user who shall remain nameless at this point, unless they uh, want to be named, in which case I might make a small annotation here. So this is from the Escapist Forum. This is the territory of Jim Sterling, who at times has expressed just blind support on some levels for Ms. Sarkeesian's positions uh, and makes fun of any of the dissenting gaming public, whether they have constructive criticism or not, because, well, we'll get into that further. And then everybody probably knows very much about Movie Bob's 
dud of an explanation as to why Ms. Anita Sarkeesian's video is well-researched, well-put-together, and uh, academic. What's funny is those words are going to be used by many, many people inside the industry to support Ms. Sarkeesian's position, despite the fact that if you paid any attention to part one of this video, or act one of this video, you'd realize that there is no real academia here, even by Anita's own admission as far as her Kickstarter video, that there is uh, not a lot when comparing her old videos to style to her new videos to show us that any of the money went into bigger, better production values that she promised in her thank you video. But again, links to all of this is always going to be down in the underbar with the exception of what I'm reading here. So, let's get into this. Nutshell. I know someone made the point about Sarkeesian already, but whatever. The point here, uh, the point where I lost my respect for her, this is the author speaking, was when I learned two things. One, she might have spammed 4chan with links to her Kickstarter video. If she didn't, she still used the gained publicity as a marketing device. Her, protected, uh, her project didn't get much initial backing. To be fair, she had 27k out of 6k uh, goal before she, uh, the spamming happened. The spamming also used an image of her that didn't appear to be available anywhere before the spamming occurred, implying that she likely had some hand in it. Also, there, uh, there's the oddity of waiting until fairly late into the campaign to post the campaign video to YouTube, and the Chan spam starting more or less the instant the video went up alongside the initial video description containing preemptive, uh, preemptive apology for the trolling that was to be received. It is also noteworthy that other feminism related Kickstarters have generated have generally not been subjected to large-scale trolling campaigns before or after Tropes vs. Women. Now that is a very interesting, interesting factoid. And it's one that's going to be explored a little further in this uh, part of the video series. Given how far into her campaign she was and that successful Kickstarter campaigns tend to have pretty similar fund, uh, funding curves, she probably would have ended up with 40 to 55k, if not for the uh, chat, uh, the chas spam, 4chan spam, and subsequent trolling. Effect, uh, that's, uh, effect, that's inaccurate. The spamming adver uh, slash advertisement by her and her crew happened long before she had her money on the first and second day of her campaign, May 17th through May 18th. See here, for uh, instance, even it even contains the numbers for the Kickstarter campaign's current point. And I'll put a link down to the links that are provided in the uh, this PM down in the underbar for your consideration. They didn't really bite. I especially love this post, Anita Sarkeesian. Uh, there has been at least one feminist on V. She had uh, 27k about two weeks later into the campaign at the point that she uh, posted her YouTube video on June 14th. Now, this sounds suspicious on some levels. Again, I, I encourage you guys, and, and I certainly do with this video, to, to think for yourselves. Look at the evidence, look at the deconstructions, look at the, in some cases, debunkings, and make your own choice. But, if after Act 3, you just want to willfully ignore any and all of the evidence that this is a con, then that's fine. Just admit that you'd rather buy into the lie than you would rather buy into any of the empirical evidence that this is not what it appears to be, which is an even bigger insult not just to feminism, but to women in general, especially in the gaming industry. But again, 
we're not to the juicy stuff yet even. This is just, this is just the dinner before our dessert. So, going on. Saying that the backlash from, uh, from which she took these supposed threats came from gamers is also highly inaccurate. She has plent, uh, plenty of hatred for various numbers of reasons. She had already spread her drivel for nearly four years on her YouTube channel, which... Fine. I, I'm already linking you to her Tropes vs. Women videos for comparisons, so I'll throw a link down to her channel there as well, so that, once again, the material can speak for itself. You take in my video, then you take in hers, or you take in hers, then you take in mine, and then maybe you retake in hers to see if what I'm saying has any kind of resonance whatsoever. Again, I'm not going to blame you if you choose that you think that she's still this warrior for young girls and women in the industry everywhere and that she is a hero to be, um, you know, have statues made to, that's you. If, if I could f see in this project and could see objectively and prove objectively your standpoints or your viewpoints of Miss Sarkeesian and her project, then I would be right there with you. Because as stated in part one, I'm not about any kind of patriarchal or misogynistic status quo. But looking at things as a whole, it's highly suspect, and I agree with this post as well. You know, some of this stuff is so anonymous that you could just say, oh, well, it was the gamers all along, and paint us, although we already, as a community, paint ourselves in a bad light, and we'll get to that in this, this installment, because again, the devil needs his due as well. Otherwise, this isn't going to be a fair and balanced project, and I want this to be anything but something that people will say is just clearly one-sided. Her Bactyl Test for Women in Movies video has uh, 650,000 views. Her Star Feminist, Tropes vs. Women, has 435,000 views, and her Oscars and the Bactyl Test has 400. 20,000 views. The Kickstarter video contain, uh, comes after all those in popularity with only 350,000 views. For all anyone knows, the majority of those comments are just from her usual previously accumulated fan base. Notice how all the of her older videos also have their comments in voting closed. The only video that had the comments open for only two weeks after which she had closed them with the following ex, uh, explanation was her Kickstarter video. This project was successfully funded as of June 16th, 2012. Note, on comments, a trigger warning. Sorry, it's a slightly long post, but again, this falls in line with things, because this is an individual saying, you know, I kind of bought into what Anita was saying, I was kind of on board, and then things stopped making sense. And that's why I'm, I'm uh, trying to, uh, to show this here. Comments in this video were closed at midnight, June 16th, 2012. I left the comments open on this video until 24 hours after the Kickstarter was finished as a way of showing why this topic is so important. I apologize for all of the hate speech, misogyny, racism, threats, and ignorance that were left below over this two-week period. The trolls only managed to prove to everyone that sexism in gaming is indeed a huge problem. Did you? Did you? See, this is why this really just doesn't even sit well with me. This is, oh, I do this, I get what I want, and then I can put whatever spin on it I want. That these aren't just, you know, people who hate her for the sake of hating her. And look, yes, I'm sure some of these people, for just purely misogynistic reasons, hated her, hated her project, hated everything about it before she even made Declaration 1. I'm not saying this doesn't exist. Again, this will be addressed. But... For her to then take any of these things, like, 
the wrong, the, you know, the, the, the most misogynistic and hate-filled elements of, like, the, say, the MRA, and to say, oh, they only hate me because they're gamers and they're afraid I'm going to take away their shiny little toys. But I'm just having an open and honest discussion. I don't want to actually change anything. And yet they act like I'm waltzing into their territory and I'm pissing all over their markings. No. No. And you're going to have to actually go through the steps to prove this. You know, this is a, an angle on some levels that even I hadn't considered when starting this project. But it's a very good point. Because it seems to be step one, get hater comments. Step two, say that they're all from one particular community. Step three, profit. In general, she doesn't like her opinions questioned or challenged. And we will get to that. There's actually a reason to it. And to be honest with you, the answer is going to surprise you. I will say this, though. It's not ego that drives this. She especially doesn't want to enter into an intellectual discourse about them with anyone because then she actually would have to honestly defend her points, which would prove uh, hard seeing as she, she is mostly copying other people's works, tropes, uh, TV uh, tropes and videos, and communications in large meaningless platitudes. Now, I spoke about how she's very much, and provably so, plagiarized Wikipedia on the damsels in distress. She's also had pro been proven to have plagiarized entire sections of TV tropes. Which, again, adds to the problem of where did the money go? If you're pulling stuff off the internet for free and plagiarizing it in some cases, even plagiarizing your own series, that's not money you had to spend. So where did the money go? Some have said that she seems to have better editing software. That's about it. And that I could understand. And yes, those are quite costly, but it's not 160 k costly in most cases. I know because I do a lot of research. I'm a film student, after all. Uh, well, film, radio, and television student, after all. I've been working in and out with different types of softwares here and there, some of which I really like, some of which I really hate because their learning curve is so severe. Sony Vega, I'm looking at you. But even the most professional packages at times are like something in the neighborhood of 140k, uh, $140. Um, dollars. Some of the most extravagant packages that come with, you know, concierge type service I've seen as high as a thousand dollars. Again, this is not 168k, or well, 158k software she's using. And that's not what the money was said to be spent for. The money was going to go to further, bigger, more expansive research, more games, and bigger production values, none of which have materialized as far as anybody can see, which we'll get into further in, part, in Act 3. The retardo amount of money only started to flow in after those publications started copying her blog posts from June 7th, almost word for word with an obvious narrative because it was the hip thing to do, and would guarantee tons of views. And evidence of all of this is in several links that again will be down in the underbar here, so I'm going to read past the links that were provided. I've seen the arguments that apparently 4chan and similar entities caused that, but that seems highly unlikely. If you want to blame anyone, lay the blame at most to these so-called game journalists, and we will be getting to them, trust me, uh, that are always on the lookout for a, a hits causing controversy and can apparently only copy a press release one-to-one -one without any critical thinking applied, but seemingly also blog posts. That's the end of that particular section there. Permit me a little uh, drink, it's getting kind of hot in here. Remember kids, when learn doing video production, always try to learn from your mistakes. As you, as my fans have heard from my Bad Cop 69 channel, how 
difficult getting part act one of this video was to be recorded. Now, getting back to where we were. You notice me say the escapist. You've noticed me talk about Jim Sterling, and you've noticed me teasing that we would be speaking about it. I'm going to try to link a bunch of Jim's arguments of, uh, or talking points down in the underbar when he talks about Anita Sarkeesian, when he talks about sexism in gaming and representations of people, because I stand by what my proclamation is. Now, this part of this video may only make sense to the people who've been here on YouTube for quite some time. If so, so be it. But I, it's, it's just the most truest ex, uh, of, of exclamations that I can give when it comes to Jim Sterling. Jim Sterling, as a game journalist, especially when trying to talk about things like sexism and gaming, is the thunderfoot of games journalism. Now, what do I mean by this? What I mean is that when talking about the problems of the gaming industry, the issues with developers, or even just a basic critique of certain games at times, though people will debate me on this and that's fine, he's usually really spot on, very factual, very with it. The problem comes when Jim started to talk about sexism in gaming and started to really bolster and hold up Anita Sarkeesian as if she was this Adonis that just showed up on the scene like some sort of immaculate conception gone awry and that she had the answers to everything. Even going so far as to write blog posts about how watching Anita Sarkeesian's videos made Jim Sterling's video games disappear because she is evil. She is this Cthulhu that gamer, that misogynistic gamers make her out to be. I wish I was joking about this, folks, but links to all this is down in the underbar. Because it it's not just enough that he, you know, interacts with, you know, the communities at large and, and so it's that he he admits that when it comes to this subject, he is a bit ignorant, but he's trying to learn. The problem is though he's absurd he's inserting his opinions as if they are some sort of objective fact, and the only people who can't see it are misogynistic, sexist gamers who just want to objectify women and make breast physics become every game that's ever out there. In fact, that we that we as gamers, as a community as a whole, seem to want Breast Physics the video game, where it's just nothing but jiggly, preferably nude, breasts, and we can make them jiggle to our heart's content. Never mind that there are women gamers who actually, to be honest with you, would go for that kind of game too, and aren't sexist, but they like boobs. Some of them are bisexual, some of them are gay, some of them are just sort of whatever, and enjoy you know, breasts and breast physics and gaming. My fiancé actually happens to be somebody who loves the Dead or Alive series and in particular Kasumi and many others because... breast physics! Oh, but she's a chauvinistic gamer, right? She's a, she's a chauvinistic woman who is only emulating the sexuality of men, and she's just a confused little girl, so she needs to sit down and shut the fuck up. And I had this discussion with you guys in part one, but since this is all going to be one video in totality, links to what chauvinistic women are is down in the underbar. It is a tactic used by radical and pseudo-feminists to say that it doesn't matter that sometimes women like games for the exact same re re reason that men do. It's that they're either brainwashed by the patriarchy or they're just emulating guys' sexuality, that they can't mean what they say, and therefore their input as a woman is invalid. But perhaps what upsets me the most when it comes to Jim Sterling isn't that he continually supports Ms. Anita Sarkeesian and her assertions, which I would like to thank Jim if you're watching this, and I doubt you are, but if you are, maybe you want to go to, to, to Act 3 
and see why you've been played, okay? I, I, I would hope you guys won't skip out on all on the rest of this part of this video here, but you know, I won't blame you on some levels because this video it has a lot of intricate parts to it, and some of you, I could understand, don't have the patience for that. But Jim, he pulls the same things at times when people question him, when people dare to speak out against him, uh, even if it's constructive criticism, by basically just saying, well, either you're with Anita Sarkeesian on some levels, or you're a misogynistic gamer pig. And I hate that, because that's not to say that they don't exist. And again, we, we will we'll probably end on that note about a, a very honest discussion with the, the community at large about what things we're not exactly doing quite right. But to sit there and just dismiss it because you don't want to hear it, because you think that, you know, just because two developers say at times that they have problems creating box art with females on it, which certainly is an issue at times, but I dare feel that he makes it into a bigger issue than it actually is on some levels, much like Anita Sarkeesian. That, that you can't have women who have a sexuality if they are a protagonist, which on some levels is, again, a bit of an issue, but not quite the ones that I think that he's not quite the mountain that this molehill that Jim himself is tending to make. And it makes it frustrating to watch his videos on these subjects because it's like he partially gets it and then he goes right back into, hey, no, I'm sorry, uh, this is all wrong. And if you support this kind of thinking, then, you know, you're part of the problem. You're, you're those, those sexist misogynists and we need to be listening more to Anita Sarkeesian. Next, we have Movie Bob Chipman. Now, unlike Jim, Movie Bob took what Jim was doing and ran with it. And ran with it, oh, he spectacularly did. Trying to utilize the fact that we all have made memes and jokes about how many times Princess Peach gets captured means Anita's points are well-researched, well-put-together, well-produced, and academic. These are literally words that have come out of Movie Bob's mouth and have oftentimes been the cause of ire when it comes to Movie Bob. Because with Bob, and as I've, I've spoken about on, about on his page, because Bob likes to promote anything and everything, it seems, to sort of uh, detract from the gaming industry. Why? Because Bob is a self-professed uh, you know, film student slash, you know, independent filmmaker, film, film, film. Now that in and of itself doesn't always have to present a conflict of interest, but let's see where film has oftentimes become an issue for us. Film has oftentimes become an issue for us because we have directors and we even have film critics like Roger Ebert who have done, gone out of their way to say that not only are games not a valid art form, but that they can never be a valid out, uh, uh, art form. Take George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, two heavy hitters in the industry who complained that um, at, at an event where they were talking about the decline of the movie industry, which that in and of itself could be an entire video series, and no, I don't plan to do that, but I digress, and said that only through movie can you actually get good uh, storytelling, that there can never be compelling stories told by video games because video games are inferior. What? Did, did, did we all just never play Final Fantasy VII? Did we all just never play Beyond Good and Evil? Did, did we all just never, ever, ever play games like, say, Metal Gear Solid 4? Say what you will about the cinematics, what have you. But there was a story there. There was character development there. I actually felt things at times for the different characters. Last of Us, to be more modern, Last of Us was a game that had me on an, a literal emotional roller coaster. It had characters that I could really mem feel for. 
It had situations that actually made me care about the different characters, something that Spielberg, that Lucas says, can never happen, that they can't make, not only can games never make a compelling story, but the games can never make you care about the characters. That these are just throwaway adventures, never to, you know, because, oh no, we never care about Link, we never care about Zelda, we never care about Sonic the Hedgehog, we never care about Mario, we never care about Princess Peach, and on and on and on. No, 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 no. And, and Ares, or Ares, excuse me, when she died in Final Fantasy VII, we were laughing. Oh, that was so funny when she got the sword through her solar plexus. Thanks to Sephiroth. I mean, my god, better hilarity was never written, am I right, gamer guys? Up top. And part of me, at least, though I haven't been able to fully substantiate this, feels that Bob came at this on some levels feeling like there was some legs to stand on for Anita's position. But as Dangerous Analysis and myself have both spoken about, proving that the gaming industry has sexism in it, it's not that fucking hard, okay? It's like trying to prove that Barack Obama is the president. Don't even get me into the birther stuff. No, I'm just saying that he is, that is his job title right now, okay? You know, it's, it's, we can look at it, we can see it, we can touch it, we can taste it, we can feel it, although I wouldn't recommend touching or tasting Barack Obama, but we have this quantifiable thing, but to what extent is it bad? To what extent is it damaging? Did Bob do anything to assert this on any kind of academic level? No. Did Bob try to assert this on any kind of objective level? No. Did Bob prove any of this that, that, that would make this into a series, Anita's series especially, that would be a workable narrative to show and focus on why these tropes actually hurt women more than they help them. I'm not trying to defend the overuse of any of the tropes or the lazy writing at times or the reliance on such things, but again, as many people have pointed out a thousand times before, there are many, many games that are completely genderless. There are many, many games, many more games at times, that don't even deal with sex and sexuality in gaming. And then there's other games that deal with sex and sexuality in a way that's actually extremely refreshing. But does any of this take it into account? No. Bob just wants to say that because on one of his main arguments being that because we make fun of the fact that Peach gets abducted a lot, which I think is comedic cannon fodder, and rightfully so, that therefore it is sexist, it is damaging, it is demeaning to women. Although, again, Bob doesn't even try to go into how demeaning this is. He doesn't even try to go into all this. Everything that Bob's video was about was about supporting Anita and calling anybody and everybody Whoever dares speak out against Anita Sarkeesian as just a misogynistic troll, without, once again, even attempting to prove any of it. At least Anita trots out those comments, as mentioned in the PM that I had just read. At least she tries to demonstrate that she's had rape threats, she's had death threats, although that's a whole debate in and of itself. You know, what is blowing off steam and what is an actual threat against somebody's body autonomy or a threat against their life? And this is a, a debate that's even going on on Twitter where now those sorts of options, uh, right or wrong, have been taken off the table. <sighs> and finally, as a smaller cross-section of it, I want to get into industry people. Industry people who support Sarkeesian. Now, there's Kotaku, which I'm not even going to go over again my disgust with Kotaku and their constant soft journalism, or the ways in which they suddenly are interested in gender swap uh, ROM hacking and ROM programming that has gone on since Anita's videos while people try to claim that, oh, it wasn't because of Anita Sarkeesian, but it was because of Anita Sarkeesian. 
which should be a meme on the internet. I swear it should be, but I, I digress. Um, th the point being, though, that they started to really just throw gaming and in journalistic integrity under the bus in order to be a part of the bandwagon, whether you're talking about the Luke Plinkett's and I think it was his battle that he had, though I could be wrong on this, forgive me for my faux pas if I do, uh, against the artists who did the character designs for Dragon's Crown. Never mind that the thief, or, ro or is it rogue? The thief or the rogue is almost completely fully dressed and is a woman, and you don't see all her lady bits if we want to go that far. And no, no, that's, that's it, because one of the sorceresses is practically spilling out of her uniform uh, and has extremely obnoxiously big boobs and in a waist that if she were a real person, she would snap in half like a twig. That, that, that was the artwork of 16-year-olds and that it was, there was, it was not welcome in the industry. And when the artist rebutted, though I'm not going to defend the artist going after you know, Kotaku for this, but I don't entirely blame him because that's such an insult to this artist who is doing these character designs not specifically to subjugate women, which is a huge point that gets missed in all of this. Whether you believe Roger Ebert or not, we can't honestly deny that games are our art. They have writers, just like movies. They have storyboarders, just like movies. They have scripters, just like movies, although that's, you know, writer scripters. They have character designers, just like people who do character and wardrobe designs for movies. And they have wardrobe designers, just like in the movies. But yet, they can't be art like movies? Are you joking me? You have to set up cameras, and you have to do animations, just like a Pixar film. But, oh, that's not like the movies? No, no. So, because, again, if we're not going to call games art, we may as well not call Pixar art. Even though it's a movie, and it's an animated movie, and it takes a lot of work, there's texture artists who make all the, you know, like if I were a 3D model, my skin tone, my facial hair color, the color of this shirt, all had to be drawn up so that they would work with the lighting system. It's not an easy task to do skinning. I know because I suck at it, but I, that's another thing entirely. Th that's not even getting into the 3D modelers, like Pixar, the th the, who do work for these video games, because without the 3D models, you have no video game unless it's pixel art. But pixel art, have you guys tried to do pixel art and have it look good? I've seen very few people outside the industry at times, and I'm a member of DeviantArt, who can really honestly pull it off. Even I, I'm only kind of good at doing it. I, I really generally suck, but that's neither here nor there. But I bow to the fact that that's fucking art. Making squares into entire people and then making those squares over and over again in different poses and in the in-between poses so that when the game plays, instead of seeing this, you see this kind of thing. That's art! And what pisses me off about, like, the Patricia Hernandez's of the world, the Kotaku's of the world, is that if your art is deemed sexist, then even if it's you making art for yourself, your artwork is oppressing women. Your artwork is making women feel like they're inferior. It is, it is sexually oppressing women. It is everything that is wrong with this culture, and you should be ashamed of yourself. So we can now just dismiss people's artwork, especially in gaming, by simply slapping on the label of sexist and saying, it ha this trash has no merit. This trash has no place in this world. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I got into artwork to try to appease people who think that anything even remotely erotic, in some cases, is pure pornography. Oh no, that woman's showing a little too much of her leg. She is completely pornographic. Oh, that lady, even though we're not actually seeing her front crotch there, she's, um, you know, oppressing women by the fact that she's ever dared pose for a picture uh, where she's not wearing any underwear, even if it's for an artistic uh, presentation.
what people like Jim Sterling on some levels, what people like Kotaku, what people... Kotaku. Kotaku. A place, a gaming site that used to show off concept art, video game art, and all this stuff that then just turned completely radicalized. Not the least of which they were hurt by the complete lack of journalistic integrity, especially by one Patricia Hernandez, who once again I want to say, I'm not against Patricia because she's a woman. I'm not against her because she's speaking out against the industry at times. I'm against her and some of the other female, one of the other female um, commentators whose name escapes me at this particular point in time, uh, who pulled a Rebecca Watson by saying that, well, sexism is always rampant in uh, the gaming industry conferences. Just some women, they're just not attuned to it. Which is something that Rebecca Watson, who is a well-known skeptic feminist, who has said many of the same things, that a lot of these girls, they're just too glib for their own good, that, that they're being sexualized, but they just don't realize it because they haven't been trained to spot it yet. Are you, are you, are you joking? It, 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 am I being punked? Where's Ashton Kutcher here? Because am I being punked? That a person's experience can't be their experience if it contradicts your unfounded subjective beliefs. And if, if I can't disprove what you experienced, I'll disprove you altogether in pseudo-feminist uh, fashion by just simply labeling you as a woman, as a chauvinist. That you enjoy this attention because you've been brainwashed by the patriarchy or, and or are emulating male sexuality because you have no sexuality of your own and therefore you don't count as a woman. Your voice doesn't count, so sit down and shut up. <sighs> what truly just upsets me about a lot of this, though, is just the fact that you then have our last character in this act, uh, the last player in this little play, a player who will be saying words that will be again, extremely, extremely familiar. And if memory serves, I think these words came out either at about the same time or possibly before uh, Movie Bob's presentation. We have Cliff Blazinski, also known affectionately as Cliffy B. He is a gentleman who makes the Gears of War series and recently left Epic, if memory serves, to go pursue his own sort of tastes with things. He states that he checked out Anita Sarkeesian's series because one of his characters from Gears of War 3, one of his female marine characters, is featured in the Tropes vs. Women logo. He came into it, as he tries to state, thinking that he was going to hate the series, but found it to be, say it with me folks, well put together, well researched, and I, I think he starts to try to say something along the lines of academic. See, I'm reminded of this sketch from The Simpsons. There was this once uh, Simpsons show, I forget the name, where Marge is at the library and she's reading kids' stories, and there's one where Lisa is in the starring role as Joan of Arc. And what I liked about it was when, the, when Lisa, with the French, if memory serves, starts to go trying to attack the British, um, one of the British individuals, in stereotypic fashion, they're all drinking tea, ha ha, and one of them goes, Oh, I do believe the French are attacking. And the other one goes, I thought we had a treaty with them. To which the first Brit says, Just because you keep saying it doesn't make it so. And then he gets an arrow in the heart. I just love that line because this seems to be what it is. Anita, Movie Bub, Cliff Blazinski, all trying to say that her presentation is academic. And yet, none of it, again, just looking objectively at the facts I presented in Act 1, there is no academia here. Her project is the very insult to academia, just to say the least. 
Cliffy B, by the way, being an individual who uh, believes that um, the Xbox One reversing its DRM policies is a lose-lose situation and means many more uh, years worth of DLC because, and I quote, you can't have a gaming industry without big budgets, without big advertising budgets, while also having a secondhand game market and a rental market. So that means he even threw Gamefly under the bus. Cliffy B being one of many developers who I might add who make more money in general than teachers, police officers, and firefighters sometimes combined. Oh yeah. But Cliffy gave Anita Sarkeesian not just a pass, but a complete glowing review. Never mind that nothing that Cliffy B says in his article, which I will try to dig up these articles as much as I don't want to have to go back to Kotaku, but again, if I have to prove my points for this part, I have to prove my points. Never mind that nothing Cliffy says has any kind of objective proof to it, any kind of empirical proof to it when you scrutinize her series. And he was just talking about part one of the series. The only thing he did was, in general, is he did the exact same thing that Movie Bob did. Took the damsels as an overused trope um, talk that we all kind of agree on, but how is that harmful to women, and ran with it. Never mind trying to prove it, just, oh, Anita's right, you know, I always had an issue with this in the gaming industry, blah, blah, blah. This just does not work. These people, for whatever reasons, just completely decide that they are not going to question any of it. Even though Cliffy B is an industry insider on some levels because he makes games, he does nothing in his article, uh, in his quotations, in his article, in his speaking about this to try to actually substantiate word one of what Cliffy says. And Cliffy is somebody who has kind of a love-hate relationship with the industry. He left Epic Games and not under the best of circumstances. He's been very much at odds with games journalists such as, wait for it, wait for it, Jim Sterling. So in a way, him throwing the industry under the bus isn't 110 percent, you know, out of, out of place because he kind of has a love-hate relationship with it. He likes making games, but he doesn't like making games anymore for the art, for the craft. Like many in the industry, he likes making games because they can make him money. And if he could just get rid of that pesky second-hand game market, and hopefully also the rental markets like Gamefly, and of course piracy, even though piracy has long since been debunked as a major cause of any kind of financial strife for the industry because he wants the ability to have almost unlimited funds and unlimited advertisement budgets and you, you are supposed to pick up the tab for all the unnecessary stuff that he wants to put into his games because it makes him money, not because he cares about the art and the craft of the games. Can you see once again why I come back to the word of the art and the craft of the video games? Because it's important. Once you start taking that out, suddenly everything is wrong. Suddenly everything is fair game. Suddenly there's no such thing as artistic in visions and, or artistic integrity. Suddenly your vision has to be sanitized for all audiences or we can't allow it to exist. In other words, Part of why I started being disillusioned myself with this project is the fact that when I would have discussions with now ex-friends and some of you YouTube users, it was very clear that you, even some of you who are artists, had a very big sort of feel that you want art by committee. That I can't draw just a giant boobed anime girl because I just happen to like that. That's my taste. That's my artistic vision. No, she has to have appropriate sized boobs and correct body um, proportions so that the young girls in the audience don't feel inferior to my drawings. And I can't do art for me, in other words. I can't even do, like, if my parents approved of my art, I couldn't do art for them either. I have to do art 
by committee. And I think that this is some of the most disgusting aspects of all of this. Oh, you think I'm being too, you know, hyperbole, that I'm just making this stuff up as I go along? Try telling that to the Nordic states, or countries, pardon me, the Nordic countries who are trying to flag any, I mean any kind of anti-feminist speech as hate speech and have it stricken. So even if a video like mine comes along with constructive criticism where I don't throw out popular euphemisms for feminism such as the C word or things of that nature that by virtue of the fact that I'm doing any kind of speaking out against any kind of feminism, pseudo or otherwise, means that I have nothing to offer to the world and therefore this video should be taken down because it's anti-feminist hate speech. But again, that's, that's a whole nother video in and of itself. I wanted to end this part, uh, this act two, by also, though, having a frank discussion with those people, with some of those people, because some people cannot be reached and this needs to be understood. That doesn't mean we allow them to do what they do and just go, oh, boys will be boys. But there is an element to this where some of the hate that Anita got was just knee-jerk misogynistic gamers. I'm probably going to be guessing, though, and say that it's not the bulk of people. Despite what ugly, fat, ugly, and slutty would portray, and I do believe in their vision, don't get me wrong, these posts, if you rounded them all up and then you took the user numbers and user base from Xbox Live and the user base from PC and the user base from, from uh, PSN or PlayStation Network, I am willing to bet you good money that now, this is a subjective, so I want to make sure people don't, don't take this as I'm trying to make this as a complete positive claim that I cannot substantiate because I don't have these numbers on me. But I'm willing to believe that these people are just a third of the population of gamers, male and female, out there. You know, because something that, that, that's been brought up is that people seem to ignore that the frag dolls exist. Girls who play games like Call of Duty and they can dish out as much as they take as far as trash talk. And they, 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 don't, they don't take it personally when people go after them because they're girls and they play games. They don't care what you feel about it and they kick a lot of butt. Oh, but no, that doesn't exist. Just like the head of 343 Studios isn't a woman, so that doesn't exist. And that because Don Matrix stepped down as director of Xbox, we now have a female um, as head of Xbox. Oh no, that doesn't exist. No, women can't get ahead in this industry. Women are complete are, subju are subjugated in the video games. Women are subjugated in the workplace. And that's partially true. But for every game company out there that that hires women and doesn't promote them, and when asked why, they're told that they are morale boosters. They are eye candy for the male programmers in the business, which does happen, and it is disgusting. There's far more other companies out there that are either headed by women or are going to be headed by women sooner or later because they treat the women as equals. You know, there's that, there's that hashtag that I've shared, that are the two hashtags, you know, one reason to be, and then uh, one reason, I think, is the other one, where there's the women talking about and should be talking about sexism in the industry and the hostile workplaces and work environments and just the, the really terrible ways in which some women are treated in the gaming industry, not to mention just in games in general. But then there's women who talk about how not all of them are sexually harassed or groped without permission at game conferences. And no, these aren't just the ugly women in the industry that nobody wants to touch, if I may use some of the rather glib sort of explanations of this. 
there's some women who are well respected and are very much looked up to in their respective fields, in their companies, and are treated as individuals, as real people, not just as a woman gamer or a woman programmer or anything of that nature. They're a team member, and an equal team member to their male counterparts. But, even though there is a third, the third has to be, for fairness, the third has to be, you know, acknowledged. If all you care about is you think that Anita's going to come in and she's going to change your games for the worst, and um, that she's going to uh, womanify or vagify your gaming, and turn your Call of Duties into My Little Pony simulators or some sort of bullcrap like that, you're wrong too. You need to grow up. If your immediate reaction to anybody saying anything that's not glowing or positive about the gaming industry, not just women, but especially the women in some cases, that you want to rape them, that, or that you want to find their kids and you want to kill them, and then sell their bodies to necrophiliacs. There's something seriously, seriously wrong with you. I would, con I would fight for your right to be able to say these inane things because we can't sit there and say, oh, well, rape is, is, is bad and, and has to be banned from the internet, but this guy calling President Obama a nigger, oh, he's completely fine. Freedom of speech there, this needs to be censored. Freedom of speech needs to mean freedom of speech. I'm not going to say I condone rape threats, whether real or just blowing off steam, but good God, look at what we're turning Twitter into. Look at all the different websites that are bending over backwards to censor almost everything now. Because now everything's offensive, everything's wrong, and a free and open internet can no longer be a free and open internet. But you can't, you, you can't seriously sit there and try to defend to me, or, or my audience here, that there's anything okay with threatening a woman, threatening to beat a woman because she dares to speak up about your video games. Whether Anita is right or wrong at, in this case, in this moment, in this instance, is irrelevant. The moment you cross that line, the moment you step over that line into I'm going to rape you or I'm going to rape you and your entire family or I'm going to find you, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to sell your bodies to necrophiliacs and laugh the whole time, there, there's no cause for that. Even if for the sake of argument Anita was starting to change your games, that is not the response to Anita Sarkeesian or anybody doing projects like that. This only serves the purposes of those who are being underhanded when it comes to using social stigmas, social issues, to lead people by the nose whose hearts are in the right place but they're not thinking. You do not speak for me. You do not speak for the community when you start talking about raping women for having the audacity to say that your video games are sexist, which in, in many cases, they are. But where that's bad is debatable. Where that is a real issue that needs addressing, that is debatable. But the way to debate it isn't to say, yeah, I heard all your facts and figures about sexism in the industry, and I would like to rebut thusly. <clears throat> a wise man once said, I'm going to rape you and I'm going to find your children and I'm going to kill them. Then I'm going to sell them to a fucking necrophiliac and he's going to have a real good time with your kids. Yeah, I hope you like your sex, you know, what you're going to try to do when you're doing it in hell. I cannot speak out when their side the Anita side is completely dishonest, intellectually, factually, or otherwise, and when they make threats or when they excuse things that they really have no business excusing, 
and then just completely ignore that side where though that probably a third of the comments she got were probably from irate gamer people who really had no idea of anything they just had knee-jerk reaction and a connection to the internet and that was all they needed that was all they cared about it's not right when either side is dishonest it's not right when either side tries to promote their viewpoint above all others. It's not correct, it's not right, especially if all that either side has to offer at this point, talking at least about the Anita camp and the sexist gamer camps, is nothing but subjectivity. You don't honestly change things on falsehoods. You don't change things, okay, on subjectivity. Because anything that is presented without evidence can easily be dismissed without evidence. Case in point, Act 1. And if anything, letting Anita speak is giving her enough rope with which to hang herself. I mean, I could almost go home with a lot of what I have already presented in previous videos as well as Act 1, but I feel that that would not go deep enough. I felt part of why I'm needing to do this video aside from the information in Act 3 is because I felt that the climate was right for people to be more objective, to be more receptive to listening to somebody who isn't just going to simply come on camera and go, Anita, you stupid cunt. Though, I've had my moments, but I stand by those moments, but those were not the moments that are going to change people's minds. Those are not the moments that are going to get people to rethink their position and realize, gee, I cannot keep going this way. Or maybe I need to look at this a different way. Maybe I need to reformulate my anger into something productive. I've done it before. I've had people tell me I am, from the ground up, completely wrong on a topic. And I may have been incensed, but you know what? Then I went out onto the internet. I went to every site I could find, including ones that I didn't agree with, to read all the information, and sometimes I found out I was wrong. Very much so. In fact, a lot of my early channel is nothing but videos where I have been wrong, and correction videos to show that I do care about intellectual honesty. I do care about minimalization of biases, especially when we're talking research, especially when we're trying, trying to be academic and present something that at least says, you can disbelieve this all you want, but objective reality doesn't care what you believe. This is what we can prove. This is what you tried to prove, but failed to prove. And in a way, that's what this is about. It's not just because evidence has fallen into my lap that will be presented in Act 3 that I really, really think people need to see and understand what this entire thing has been about. That through prestidigitation and misdirection, we've been barking up one tree, not realizing of the tree that's right behind us that's actually the tree that's most important. But this wasn't just, this wasn't for just the sake of, oh, I'm going to vilify Anita Sarkeesian. This wasn't about, oh, gee, how can I make her look like a fool? Because that doesn't serve any greater purpose other than to have people who already agree with uh, my positions come to my videos so that they can get their echo chamber on. This video especially, is not about trying to create an echo chamber. This is trying to say, what can we substantiate about this project, good or bad? What can we actually prove? What has she actually proven? But then it goes deeper, and it's going to keep going deeper, because we've done Act 1, where I went after her works as far as the Tropes vs. Women three-part series. I didn't go as in-depth as I could have, but I don't think I needed to go much deeper than I already have in previous videos in this one. We've talked about the in-the-between people here. We've talked about her out-and-out -out supporters in the game journalism and gaming industry, but we've also talked about her detractors who just detract from her because she claims that she's a feminist, because she's a woman, because she dares to speak up, and why 
that is not a position that has any legs to stand on and is counterproductive to this entire talk and in a way plays right into the hands of Anita and certain parties of interest. Again, I, it's hard for me not to certain, say names, but that's what part three is about. So, with this, we conclude part two, act two, excuse me, and we will be moving on to act three.